I want to tell you a story. And unlike a lot of the stories that I tell to elementary school kids when I'm working with them, teaching on uh, writing about creative um, storytelling, this isn't a very happy one, at least not at the beginning. There was once a 12-year-old girl who cried for the most part every day. Screw it, sometimes she cried multiple times a day. And she hated admitting weakness, but when things got really bad, she would run to her mom with tears streaming down her face. Her dad said to her mom that maybe journaling would help, so soon she started writing. And every single page in that journal began with four words. I feel sad right now. Or I feel sad today. She became a 13-year-old girl who cried every day. And after less than two years, she had filled two journals. And that no good reason turned into reasons of plenty. Maybe she was sad because she knew that she was lucky, but no one seemed to understand that every gleaming opportunity was matched in equal parts by sacrifice. Maybe she was lonely because for every out of this world experience, there was something she had missed, nothing to hold in common with her friends. The game Never Have I Ever was so easy for her. No wild waves, no Disneyland, no ninth grade boat dance, no Tolo, no AP art history field trip to the Portland Art Museum because she was out of town giving a speech. She doesn't even remember where, but she remembers seeing the pictures on Facebook. Lane Sutton told us about that depression from checking too much. She remembers the pictures and she remembers all of her classmates' smiles. Maybe she was jealous of her older sister, who was oh so much prettier than her, had more friends, went to more parties, got asked to more dances. The older sister played two instruments with a finesse and grace that the younger sister had never known. That girl was me. This is me at 12. And uh, you might recognize the photo if you've seen my TED talk. That was in 2010. And me at 13, um, that was early in 2011, and I was receiving an award from the National Education Association's Foundation for outstanding service to public education. Yes, that's a mouthful. <laughs> so I had TED, travel, interviews. Kids would sometimes run up to me after conferences saying, you inspired me, which is crazy the first time it happens and never loses its craziness after that. By anyone's standards, I was on top of the world. I knew up here that I was on top of the world, so how could I feel like I was at the bottom of it? I bring this story up of all stories because most of us never bring stories like this up, and we should. We don't bring these stories up because we're scared, let's face it. We're scared that we look like spoiled babies with privilege who have pity parties for fun. Instead of just scared kids trying to figure out who they are and where they fit. We don't bring stories like this up until we're adults who can laugh off the hormonal madness of teenagehood because we can laugh at everything that happened when we were 12, 13, 14 years old through the fond lenses of nostalgia. We can laugh at how silly we were. I clung to that vision when I was 12. I fed off of the hope that someday I would be able to look at it, look back, and laugh it all off like it was one bad dream. My mantra was, this too shall pass. And soon my goal in life became to make it out somewhere. As a kid, I learned about the cenotes of the Yucatan Peninsula, connections to vast networks of rivers underneath caves. And this image enchanted me because I saw myself within it. I love metaphors. And I felt like I was that diver, except I was trapped in a subterranean river instead of at the end with the light. The image is alternately terrifying and hopeful. Terrifying because these caves are vast, dark, and deep, but hopeful because some rivers are so long they wind their way out to sea. And TEDx Redmond fits at the strange crossroads, yes, crossroads, between grandeur and groundlessness, between hope and these hypocrisies of my life. Some days, I would have a meeting in the same room for the committee where I'd broken down in tears that day. And the committee members who gathered round in their wooden chairs as we passed around bags of Lay's chips and uh, made jokes, they never knew that. And they also might not know how much they meant to me. Their big smiles, their bad jokes, their significantly worse attempts to sing. I'm looking at you, Julian. <laughs> These were things that made me happy. Blame me, committee members, for calling too many meetings. I know that I did. 
And when people asked me why I was investing so much time and energy and sleepless nights in a conference that took place for one day in September, I realized I cared so much about TEDx Redmond because it wasn't just caring about TEDx Redmond, it was caring about myself. I was selfish. And it feels like such a relief to say that. Because, you know, when I was 12, and those of you who knew me then know this, I was obsessed with the idea of true altruism, how you could give it all up so that other people could have it all. The people that are lionized in pop culture who make it on episodes of Dirty Jobs, or on a larger scale, Gandhi or Mother Teresa, or any of the other people, the idols that we hold up. And these people are incredible. But it was only when I realized that sometimes the best passions are the ones that give back to you, that don't just take, that I also fully appreciated TEDx Redmond. You see, of all the things that TEDx Redmond has given me, one of the greatest was by far the most selfish. <laughs> A month or two after the conference in 2011, I walked into the Redmond Library's YA section in classic Adora being casual wear. No, this is not it. <laughs> it was a giant ugly sweater and green cargo pants inherited from Hattie Yang, committee member previously. Some of you have seen her perform. And it had not occurred to me that I might see in this getup anyone that I would know. And then, just as I reached for a book with a really cheesy looking cover, because let's face it, this is YA fiction, <laughs> I turn around and I see a certain familiar face. Oh crap, I thought, that looks like Julian. At this point, I didn't know him that well. Yeah, he, he elicits that reaction in everybody, I think, right? <laughs> Julian, on his laptop, he was sitting in one of those super tall chairs in the YA section. Anyone who's been to the Redmond Library? Can I get some? Yeah, I represent. Guys, you need to read more. Um, <laughs> he was sitting in one of those super tall chairs. I sneakily looked behind me to make sure it was him. And then I turned around really fast because I didn't want him to see me looking behind me to verify that it was him because I probably should have recognized him at the first time. Then I decided that I would just walk over to him and say hi super casually as if I hadn't seen him. So I do that. Hi. And he's like, yeah, I saw you. <laughs> This shouldn't have been a big deal. I said something ineffectually about TEDx Redmond and said, see you. And uh, I know that this generation is guilty of using the word awkward over much, but that moment was awkward. Sometime in the post-mortification reflection period <laughs> that exists, I realized why it had bothered me so much. It was because I didn't know what to say, what to say outside of TEDx Redmond. And I realized vehemently that I never wanted that to happen again. To run into TEDx teammates and never have anything to talk about because TEDx Redmond was our one shared experience. And outside of that, what did we have in common? Did I know them as people? Or were we just a bunch of kids working on the same thing for a couple months? What if, without TEDx Redmond, my life would revert to these awkward run-ins at the Redmond Library making fumbling small talk when we had once shared ideas worth spreading? And I wonder if you guys will think about that same question, because I hope a lot of you have met new people today. And I want you to find more than TEDx Redmond that brings you together. Now for me, this fumbling small talk and awkward run-ins idea, it was a scary future to think about. And at that point in the year, I was feeling better. I didn't cry that often. I enjoyed school. I looked forward to things. But I felt myself slipping back into a metaphorical cenote. And then we got back together for our first planning meetings. And group sing-alongs of We Are Young happened. A giant work party at Ethan and Jessica Parents' house happened. We ordered pizza, devoured the parents' ice cream, which they have still never been reimbursed for, accidentally <laughs> stained their driveway with red paint, and capped off the successful day with jumping way too many of us together on the backyard trampoline. There was a Microsoft run with Maya, and it felt like Halloween, except instead of someone's mom driving door to door in an SUV to drop the kids off for candy, it was Maya's long-suffering dad dropping us, building the building. And Maya and I scrambled up the stairs like bosses, visiting every single darn kitchenette and coffee room in every single darn building on this campus, <laughs> posting up flyers. TEDx Redmond 2012 happened. And that September day, I saw little kids standing on tiptoes to see the stage. Maybe you heard Oktar say that there are little kids whose noses barely make it over the tables. And backstage, strains of cello drifted through the hallways, mixing with the words of speakers rehearsing their talks. In that moment last year, I stood alone backstage, but I'd never felt more unity. So you see, of all the selfish things I'd wanted, TEDx Redmond gave me the most wonderfully self-serving of them all, my sense of belonging. And not just any sense of belonging, but one to something larger, greater, and more significant than all my travels or accolades or awards could have brought.
a sense of belonging to each other, along with our shared and divergent dreams, ideas, and visions. If you actually came back in time from that break, you heard some of Macklemore's Can't Hold Us. Raise your hand if you are familiar with the song. OK, good. Pretty much everybody. <laughs> and maybe you've heard that line um, about uh, his city right behind me. My city's right behind me. If I fall, they got me. And it's one of my favorite lines in the song. Because in a sense, it encapsulates why I decided to tell you about who I was at 12 and 13 years old. Before I walked on stage, I was really nervous. And Maya gave me this big hug and was like, you're going to do great. And that was the moment when I felt like I have my city right behind me. When we started informally discussing a TEDx Redmond 2013, I hadn't started a journal entry with I feel sad for more than a year. And after a meeting, I say meeting in quotes because it was at Yogurtland. <laughs> after a meeting at Yogurtland that started with rounds of apples to apples, everyone came back to my house. I managed to convince almost everyone, with Maya and Priya being the reasonable detractors, to clamber up a ladder onto the roof with me. You can't see it in the photo, but if I could have enfolded every single one of these people in a giant hug under that starry sky, I would have. The best I could do afterwards was to quote that line from Perks of Being a Wallflower. You know it. <laughs> in that moment, I swear we were infinite. In that moment, I felt peace, glee, belonging. If I could look back at my 12-year-old self and tell her that these moments would happen, every single one of them, I would. But maybe, even if she didn't know that this was how her happiness would manifest itself, that this was one of the ways she would emerge from the cenotes, she knew something very valuable when she started to organize TEDx Redmond. If you ever come to a place where you feel like you don't belong anywhere, then create a place where you do. For you, that place may be robotics or roller skating, cross country or sitar playing, national novel writing month, or speech and debate, or philosophy. <laughs> or that place can be a combination of the above and a thousand other things. Four years ago, for a girl who cried every day, that place was called TEDx Redmond. Thank you to everyone, to this committee, to this audience, for everything you didn't know you did for me, and everything you knew you did. Thank you.